This is Scriptural Pursuit with your host, Glenn Russell. It's been said that every peace treaty contains the seeds of injustice for the next war, and every victory is the prelude to the next defeat. That may be the sad pattern of human history with our perpetual propensity for injustice and violent struggles. But how will the cosmic conflict between good and evil end? What will be the final events? And will there be a victory for good and the ultimate destruction of evil? Will sin rise again? These are questions that we all have as we discuss the great controversy. Welcome to Scripture Pursuit. I'm Glenn Russell, your host, and today we're concluding our series exploring the great cosmic conflict between good and evil. We're so glad you've joined our discussion today entitled The Triumph of God's Love. We're delighted to welcome as our guest, Christian Martin, Pastor Christian Martin. Welcome. Glad to have you with us, Christian. Thank you very much. It's my my joy to, to be a part of this. And Christian, you began life in Argentina and now you're serving in Virginia. Is that is that right? That is right. Uh, born in Argentina, though I came to the United States when I was only five years old. Okay. And, um, and so I lived most of my childhood in, in Texas. And um, so, yeah, I um, I quickly learned Spanish. I mean, English rather. And uh, so I'm bilingual thanks to my parents. Th believe me, they kept the Spanish at home. <laughs> they didn't, <laughs> didn't let me forget. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Now, uh, you uh, you're married, a uh, happy husband of one wife and and father of a couple of children. That's right. That's right. Uh, my wife and I recently celebrated our twenty third wedding anniversary, and um, and we have two teens. Um, Elijah is sixteen and Mariah is fourteen. So great time to to enjoy life as family. <laughs> Now, you also have an interest in, in healthy living and, and uh, do quite a bit of running. Uh, I do. Not, not running away from your kids and, and home, but uh, sometimes they might even join you. Yeah, well, I, uh, I enjoy long distance running. In fact, I ran a marathon last fall, the Marine Corps Marathon, and I've registered to run this coming fall, the Seven Bridges Marathon right there in Tennessee. And uh, I was looking, looking forward to that. Excellent. Well, we, we especially are interested in your ministry of Scripture. We yes. know that you host a, a program with your wife entitled Wake Up With Hope. You can find that on Hope Channel. I'd encourage folks to watch that. But uh, today we want to focus on this idea of how does it all end in this great controversy? Before we go any further, Christian, would you lead us in prayer that God will guide our study of the Scriptures? Absolutely. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are, Lord, to have the true and humbling um, opportunity to be able to open the inspired Word of God and to seek um, you with all our hearts. Yeah. And Lord, we claim the promise that when we do so, you will be found. And so we pray that um, that you would draw near to us now as we uh, share Scripture together and as we seek to know you more. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. So we've been looking at this great controversy program mm -hmm. after program. We're now on number 13 uh, in this series. Yes. It's a conflict between good and evil. It's a conflict over the character of God and the false accusations and deceptions of, of Satan. And as we come down to the end, it's not going to just whimper out. There's going to be a climax in, in a major mm -hmm. conflict. Uh, Christian, we would like to say, oh, everything's going to be sweet and easy and, and so forth. But that's not what Scripture tells us, is it? No, no, it's not. It's not going to get easy. Um, but I can tell you this, though. The harder it gets, okay, the closer God wants to be with us. Um, and the closer he is to us, um, the stronger we get to endure whatever we go through. And so it's not to say that, yes, things are going to get harder. Things are going to get more difficult. Yes, that's, while that's true, there is reason to have great, great hope because we're not going to get through it alone. We're not going to get through it alone. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know uh, Christians who are so terrified of mm -hmm. final events, last day events, that, that they have trouble sleeping. They, they mm -hmm. worry, am I going to be able to stand? You know, I, I'm, I, I don't like pain. I don't like suffering. Could I endure persecution are all questions that people have. What will enable us to stand? Is it going to be our fortitude, our, 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 
strong moral characters, what will enable us to stand? Mm, you know, that, that's a good, great question because uh, we need to know. Yep. We need to know. It's a must. Uh, we, we can't just be wandering through life thinking that uh, we just have to make it one day at a time, you know, one day at a time. Um, the reality is, is that the, the, let me put it this way, the good work that God has begun in us, mm. in Philippians says, mm -hmm. he will complete it. He will complete it. And so just as much as I can give testimony that my life has been transformed in Christ. I'm not the person I used to be. Uh, I've been born again. My, my heart has been transformed. Um, just as surely as God uh, accomplished all those things, um, he will see me through. Mm -hmm. In other words, he will guard my heart. He will carry me through. He will supply everything that I need to finish just as early as he begun, I'm gonna, he's gonna finish it in me. And but you ask specifically, what is it that is gonna enable us to endure until the end? Well, one key factor, Glenn, and it's it's something I'm holding right in front of me here, and this this book right here. Hmm. Uh it's it's the Bible. The Bible. Um, you know, there's a reason why this book has endured uh millenniums of of persecution, of attacks, and uh, and yet. Uh, we still have it within our reach mm. uh, or privileged and humbled to still have it be within our reach. Uh, we know that many others in different countries don't as easily as we do. But but that gives testimony that God has protected, guarded the word of God so that we can have um, the the strength and power and source of, of endurance that comes from the Bible. Um, let me share with you a verse. Can I? Um Please. Uh, I think about John chapter 8, verse 32, for example. Um, John chapter 8, verse 32, uh, it says there, Jesus himself says, and you shall know the truth, hmm. and the truth shall make you free. Okay? Um, that right there is a key verse. And you know the word know uh, is a very, very specific word. It's a very key word, to know. Um in um in the Greek, the word no, um ginosko is is a word that that is very intimate. Um when Gabriel said, Mary, you're pregnant, she says, Well, how can how can I be pregnant if I have not known a man? <laughs> okay. Um, so to know actually implies in the original language sexual intimacy. And, and so we're talking about a very, very strong word here that's used to know. To know the truth. And who is the truth? Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then another verse that I think of is John 17, 17, which is uh, just a few chapters over. Uh, it says, sanctify them by your truth. Thy word, your word, is truth. And to be sanctified means to be set apart. To be set apart mm -hmm. and made holy. To come out of. To be set apart, it means to come out of, to be set apart. And in 1 Peter 2.9, I, I think of the verse that says that we are called out of darkness, right, into his marvelous light, right? And so to be called out is actually the word ecclesia, which means literally the church. And so, Glenn, if I were to sum it up, I'm, I'm going to say something that most people would probably not really... Um, I'm not going to say disagree, but but they might not have thought of it this way. But if we're going to endure until the end, um, the church plays a very key role in my life. Mm -hmm. The church. And when I mean the church, I'm not merely talking about the physical building down down some 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 road in town. I'm talking about the body of Christ, fellow believers, fellow disciples, assembling ourselves together, pressing together. Um, listening to the word of God, being faithfully preached, all these are factors that will enable us to, to make it to the end. 
Uh, you, you're reminding me also of another passage, very familiar one in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says here, uh, here's a call for the patience or the endurance of the saints. You know, how are we going to stand? How are we going to endure? And it gives two qualities, those who keep the commandments of God and, and the faith of Jesus. Where do we find the commandments? Where do we find the faith of Jesus? Where is Jesus portrayed and revealed to us in his word? So making sure we're standing on scripture. And I, I would just say we need to spend more time in scripture than we do in social media, than we do in, in politics, than we do in sports and recreations and leisure. Uh, we have a, a sad reality of quite a bit of biblical illiteracy where mm. we, we know about our Bibles, but we don't know them so well. So that's that's a key thing for us. But it also reminds me that there's going to be a central issue here at the end of time, as it has been all through history, and that's the issue of worship. Yes. You know, when we yes. look earlier in chapter 14 of Revelation, the three angels' messages, we see very clearly that worship is a key thing. And we have some choices about worship. God loves to give us freedom of choice. So we can worship the Creator God or we can worship substitutes. So. Mm. What is this aspect of worship as we get to the final days of the great controversy? Yes, yes, that's a great, great um, question because this has to be something we fully understand. And that is, you're right, worship will be a central issue in the closing events of Earth's history. There's no doubt about that. You called it the great controversy. Um, and that's true. There's two sides, um, and there's two spiritual beings. Mm. Um, and one of them, uh, is, of course, God, God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who we know is worthy of all worship. The other one is a fallen, rebellious angel, okay, who from the very beginning, he allowed pride to uh, fill his heart, and he coveted the worship that God was receiving as a, re as a created being. Um, and we know the story too well. Lucifer became Satan, the devil, and uh, and his his... His eagerness to, to be like God or to receive worship uh, hasn't changed. And so he still covets worship from the inhabitants of earth. And so this great controversy is between God and Satan, who both um, stand before us as beings that we as intelligent human beings will ultimately choose whom are we going to worship? Whom are we going to worship? Um, and, and, you know, true worship True worship, Jesus identified it as worshiping him in spirit and in truth. True. Uh, true worship involves God himself. Apart from God, I cannot truly worship. Okay. Um, now, when the Holy Spirit is at work in my life, true worship, in fact, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in me. See, so I can't even offer true worship apart from the Holy Spirit. Hmm. It's the Holy Spirit who produces that fruit in me that expresses itself in worship. Um, and at the same time, when we seek self, okay, and um, and and seek to do my own will rather than God's will, um, there is worship taking place, worship taking place, because the object of worship becomes me, myself, and I, the false counterfeit trinity, right? Um, and, and that becomes a self-centered worship, that um, that does not necessitate uh, the work of the Holy Spirit because it's the carnal nature that becomes the focus and produces this false worship. Um, and so, you know, if I were to go to a text, I would think of, uh, for example, uh, Revelation 14. I mean, you know, we, we are focusing on Revelation. So why don't we focus on Revelation by going to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. And um, and Glenn, here's here's a a, a a phrase here that that I think gives us this great insight in 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 worship and something that will take place before the coming of Christ. It says there that John in vision he behold he beheld the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him one hundred forty four thousand. Notice this characteristic though, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay. Um, the mental reality. Yes, exactly. You know, the name in the Hebrew context 
Mm -hmm. uh, is one's character. If you look at the names of various Old Testament characters, uh, they all they all have characteristics of 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 values and principles that um, that are embedded there in their name. It's a character, and so here, um, those who stand at the end have the Father's name written on their foreheads. That's because they reflect the character of God as the result of having been sanctified, being set apart. Their characters have been transformed and renewed, and, and now they reflect the character of God. When we worship God in the spirit and truth, uh, character is transformed. Mm -hmm. Our characters are changed to reflect the character of the one that whom we worship. By beholding, we become changed. Um, and so the seal of God really becomes uh, uh, a proof, if I could put it that way, fruit, evidence mm. of whom we worship. You know, as, as you're explaining this idea of worship, I'm reminded over and over again, Revelation, the question is asked, who is worthy? And isn't that what worship is all about? Who yes. is worthy? And, and think about it, you know, we can choose... Uh, superstars, celebrities, we can choose athletes, we can choose politicians and give our allegiance or our time to them. Are they really worthy? You mm. know, are they worthy of devoting our lives and following every move they make, etc.? When there's one alone, who uh, the only one who's ever given his life for us, Yes. Uh, he alone is worthy. The one who's been raised and is interceding for us now. As we move closer, because unfortunately, uh, time keeps moving on in our discussion here. Um, it's, it seems to me when I look at Revelation, we have this going back and forth. We have these, uh, we get the scenes from heaven and then we see what's going on on earth and the scene from heaven and what's going on yes. on earth. And on earth, we have both the things that are happening to the righteous and, and happening to the wicked. So we have uh, this loud cry, call to repentance, this mm. the three angels' messages. We have uh, you know, early and latter rain being poured out. So even at the time when God's people are most depressed, he's pouring out his spirit into mm. our lives. Yes. Well, what, a, what a reassurance that is. The need for the Holy Spirit, it's our greatest need, isn't it? On a yes. daily basis to be filled and anointed. And as we move towards what final events would you want to point us to before the second coming, uh, leaving in mind that we've got to get to the great conclusion as well? Yes, yes. Great question. You know, when you look at Revelation, the central theme of Revelation is the Lamb. Um, the Lamb is mentioned 28 times in, in just, you know, a few chapters. And so, so the Lamb becomes the focus and worship becomes a central issue. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, uh, we see that there's heavenly beings that worship him who lives forever and ever. And as they worship him, notice what they specifically express. They say, you are worthy, O Lord. And Glenn, you just said the word worthy. He's worthy to be worshiped. In fact, the word worth, worthy, is a root word from the of the of the the word worship. Um, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power for you. And here, why? Here's one reason why he's worthy. Mm. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Okay, and so there's a, an emphasis there. We worship him because he's the creator. He's the creator. And, and when you think about God as the creator God, it makes sense why in Revelation chapter 14, we find three messages that are to be proclaimed uh, before the coming of Christ. They're called the three angels' message. And the first angels' message is, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. Hmm. Worship him. That's the call to, to people on earth before the coming of Christ. Worship who? Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Who is that? The creator. He's the one who made heaven and earth, the creator God. And so as we look back to Genesis and look at the acts of the creator, we can't help but to notice he created all things in six days, but then he did something that we can't do. He creates time, an additional 24-hour period. For what purpose? Ah, to worship him, to worship him, to 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 recognize that where we came from so that we can know where we're going. The creator God wants us to remember him as our creator so that we can know where we're going. 
And you know what? If we're going to understand how the story ends, how the great controversy ends, how all this comes to a grand finale, we need to remember where we came from. Mm. And the creator gave us a weekly reminder of where we came from, that we were created in his image. The Sabbath, Glenn, becomes actually a central factor in the final events of Earth's history. The seven-day Sabbath is not just the seventh day set apart uh, to rest and, and take time off work to go to church. No, the seventh-day Sabbath becomes at the very heart of worship in which we create recognize our Creator God. And because the enemy, the other you know, opposing entity in this great controversy, you know, he's going to attack the very thing that he hates the most. That's and right. that is anything that points us to worship God, he's going to hate. So mm -hmm. the Sabbath becomes one of his objects of hatred. And boy, we've been looking at this series and taking glimpses of how he's done that. One way he's done that is to attack the very institution that God established as as the way for us to worship and remember our creator, and that's the Sabbath. There's there's definitely an undermining of the essence of the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath becomes very key in that the enemy seeks to cause us to remove our focus away from the Sabbath and turn it into, or turn our focus into um, a counterfeit Sabbath. Everything that, every truth we just discover in scripture has a counterfeit. Yeah. And uh, and the Sabbath is no exception. And um, and that's why our study of the book of Revelation becomes paramount, because it mm -hmm. reveals to us these um, these deceptions that the enemy is going to seek to deceive even, even the very elect. Now, the events of the last days, they build up to a climax. We 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 see in Revelation 15 and 16, uh, the pouring out of these last plagues. And, and some people would think that, oh, that's God being so cruel and harsh. But but in Revelation 15, uh, it says, uh, as they're talking about the song of Moses and so forth, it says, great and wonderful are your deeds. So let's remember that all the destructive forces at Good the point. end of time are not coming from God's hand. Uh, the devil is finally showing his true character in these horrific events that take place at the end of time. God has yeah. had to allow sin to go mm. on for a while so that we can get pretty disgusted with it and, and choose him and yeah. choose his way. Uh, but there will be uh, dramatic events. Again, just a reminder, uh, since our time is short here, that, that there will be the absolute confidence that God's followers will have. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And so... Yeah. They're in, they're in God's hands, and the devil yeah. can't rest them out. That's right. That's right. And they follow the Lamb because they recognize his voice. Mm. Uh, the reason I spend time in the Word of God is because it's time with him when I, when I listen and recognize his voice more and more, so much so that um, it sharpens my discernment. Uh, when, when I hear the voice leading me, guiding me, which way to go, I discern the voice of God because I've spent time with him. And that's the voice that will lead me all the way, you know, and, and, you know, God is a God of, of love. He's a, he's a, he's a God of, of, of mercy and justice. He's also a God of order. So there's a due process in bringing an end to sin. That due process is to actually facilitate and increase my trust in him as an intelligent human being myself, as humans created in the image of God and, and trust, Glenn, is how love grows. It's the only way that love can grow, when we have trust. And, you know, and the judgment and the millennium are all parts of God's way of, of dealing with sin, putting an end to it um, through due process. And, you know, why, do you, why does God allow um, sin to go on and on? Well, you know what? One thing is we have to remember is this that he does promise that he's going to make things right. Mm. But when it's all said and done, he's going to have the final word. And, and God is so loving, so kind, that his, his love can only be chosen and accepted by our free will. Yes. Um, and, you know, I'm reminded of a story of, of a boy that was reading his storybook that his dad had given him for his birthday about cowboys and Indians. And his dad overhears him saying, you just wait and see, you just wait and see. 
And the dad couldn't help but to interrupt and say, um, son, what are you talking about? Oh, well, dad, you know, the, cow, the, the bad guys appear to be winning, but I'm telling them, you just wait and see. Wait and see what the father asked. And the boy said, well, dad, I've read the final chapter. Mm. And so I know how the story ends. And, you know, we have the final chapter within our reach, Glenn. We can be assured of a triumphant victory when it's all said and done. When I wake up in the morning, I can say, I am a son of the king. I know how this story ends. Um, I am a daughter of the king. I know who I am in Christ. And that gives us confidence to endure day by day, moment by moment, because we have the victory in Christ. It's been given to us. Like you said, we have to be patient to see God work things out together for good. Because when it's all said and done, sin will not rise again. It will be completely Amen. done away with, and, uh, and Christ will reign forever. Just in our last couple of minutes, let's go to that final chapter yes. before the eternity. Let's, it's not the final chapter forever. There's a whole eternity. But just actually in Revelation 21, just let me highlight a couple of things, and then I'll let you wrap it up for us, Christian. Okay. It says in Revelation chapter 21, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And then dropping down, it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain any more, for the former things are passed away. Then he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all yes. things new. Take yeah. us to that conclusion, that triumphant victory. Sin will not rise again, and God is going to make all things new. What glorious good news. Oh, it's so good news. Because the same creator God who created us in his image, he is the very God, the same one who's going to complete the good work. You know, and, I, and I'm reminded, Glenn, that, that God, God and God alone is the author and finisher of my faith. Even the faith I practice to put my trust in him is not anything that I myself can produce apart from Christ. He produces, offers the very faith that will cling to Jesus till the end. You know, I I know that as we spend time in Revelation, as we spend time in the book of God, um, we will know that voice. It's going to be the sweetest voice. And that voice will tell us, you're my beloved. I love you. Hmm. I have a future and a hope for you. I love you with an everlasting love. And it's my focus on Christ and listening to that voice, Glenn, that will give me the heart to focus on him, it will lead me to the end. And the very same God that created me in his image is going to be the same God who will restore his image in me, mm -hmm. and we will reign forever. And that's the greatest news that we could ever re hear. Well, I wish we had more time, Christian. We've just uh, barely touched the surface of God's good news and, and the great hope that we find in our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Christian. Thank Blessings you. to you and your ministry there in, uh, in Virginia, in Haymarket, and also blessings on your family. And now, uh, just want to remind our listeners and viewers that we're starting a new series that will be exploring the Gospel of Mark. So join us again next time. But until then, today and every day, let's continue to pursue the God of the Scriptures. This is Scriptural Pursuit with your host, Glenn Russell. 